Well everyone, it's here. The adult Thomas and Friends fandom disagree on a lot of things. We disagree on which narrator is best, which special is best, our thoughts on fan service, and so much more. But there's one debate that has been gone over so many times that it almost seems unanswerable. And that debate is, are seasons 6 and 7 truly classic seasons? In this video, I'll be talking about the Ghislaine era of Thomas, that's season 6 and 7, and telling you my thoughts on them. At the end, we'll be looking at my final decision. Do I feel that they are classic, or simply a shadow of the Thomas that we all know and love? So please subscribe to boost my ego, and let's talk about these controversial seasons. Roll the intro. Season 6 and 7 were kind of the awkward adolescent phase of Thomas, and today there are five areas I want to group my thoughts on them into, and the first of those is the writing. Part 1, the writing. When evaluating any season, I always look at the writing first. A lot of people say that the writing for season 6 is much more boring than in the previous episodes, and only gets worse for season 7. Well, I want to disagree with that opinion today. In my opinion, the writing in these seasons is still very strong, and, get this, gets better in Season 7. Let's start with the writing of Season 6. Season 6 was slower than Season 7 in my opinion, and this has both advantages and disadvantages. Comedy in Season 6 was probably better for it. No Sleep for Cranky in particular is a hilarious episode and a newfound gem for me. Thomas and the Jet Engine is another episode that just has you laughing start to finish. That's not the only fantastic episode in terms of writing in Season 6. Salty Secret introduces a strong character and builds up old ones. The pack episodes are a good introduction to their little spin-off. And Toby Had Little Lamb is absolutely fantastic and is probably one of my favourite Toby episodes to this day. Edward the Really Useful Engine, Duncan Duncan, the list of writing successes just goes on. Gordon Takes a Tumble had one of the best crashes in the entire show and that worked from a writing standpoint as well in the episode. In some places, I'd say that Season 6 can compete with the seasons before it, in terms of writing, never mind match them. However, Season 6 also has plenty of writing duds. The team heading the franchise has had a lot of changes to it during and following Magic Railroad, so an updated team of writers were trying to get to grips with how the show worked. This season honestly struggled a little with the tone of Thomas. There aren't any Three Strikes Formula episodes here, but it was clear to see that the finesse of Season 5 was somewhat lost. There are plenty of really quite childish episodes this season. See Percy and the Haunted Mine, or Jack Frost, not to mention Buffer Bother, as well as some which seem to disregard continuity altogether, such as Middle Engine or Rusty Saves the Day. I don't think Season 6's writing is bad or particularly fantastic. I think it's a very mixed bag, the most mixed bag of any classic season. I would say that in terms of writing at least, Season 6 is a classic season, just one with the kind of duds that the previous seasons didn't have. However, I have much more to say about Season 7's writing, and I think it's honestly a lot more interesting. Everyone knows that I think the most underrated season of Thomas is Season 9, but if I had to choose a second, it would probably be Season 7. Season 7's writing is so varied, every episode feels completely different. This season was transitional, and so the writing style is a little awkwardly stretched between good and bad. Sure, morals were pushed a little too much at the end of episodes, but the episode plotlines themselves were really strong. There are so many great episodes this season, and it really does feel like a finale to Classic Thomas. Salty's Stormy Tale was my favourite episode of both seasons combined when I rewatched them for this video. It really gives Salty a lot more substance, and feels more like a Season 5 episode than a Season 7 one. It's very difficult to talk about the writing for this season without going into the characters, but that's a different section of the video, so suffice to say for now that one of the reasons I actually prefer this season to Season 6 in terms of writing is that it's a lot more character driven. A lot of Season 6's episodes were simply, something happens to a character, they react somehow and learn a lesson. Season 7 has the events of episodes actively driven forward by the characters. From Bill and Ben rebelling against Fergus, to the wonderful arcs of the new characters, Season 7 was no doubt made great by its cast. However, I would be lying if I said that this season was flawless. There are some poor episodes here and there, Edward's Brass Band and Renaes and the Roller Coaster in particular. Those episodes, particularly Renaes and the Roller Coaster, feel very like they came out of Season 10. 
Renaissance on the roller coaster is particularly bad because it tries to make the episode feel like a wild runaway roller coaster hybrid, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't hit the seriousness like in A Close Shave, and it doesn't hit the humour like in Thomas and the Jet Engine. This results in a very lacklustre sequence, in my opinion. Have you noticed something though? I didn't put the old bridge and what's the matter with Henry on my list of bad episodes from this season. Why on earth would I not classify the two episodes that everyone thinks are the worst of the season as bad? Well, I don't actually think they are all that bad. People complain about the old bridge portraying Scarlowy out of character, and believe me, I do agree. However, there's a theory that this episode actually takes place during the olden days when Scarlowy and Renez first came to Sodor. Cut out a very small Duncan cameo, and no one except them and the Fat Controller are in the episode. Besides, the episode teaches a really strong moral, it just perhaps had the wrong context for it. I don't love the episode, but when placed in the right time period, it can just about work. As for what's the matter with Henry, I like it. Wait, wait, no, please don't shoot, I can explain! What's the matter with Henry is often criticised because it portrays Thomas and Percy out of character, and uses the trope where Henry is ill. <sighs> Alright, let's get something straight. Back in Season 7, Henry being ill wasn't a trope. We're so used to it now because we've lived through the Brenner and Miller errors, particularly the latter, which always showed Henry as a bumbling sick coward. Back here, this was simply his age catching up with him. Just because someone is sick once, and then again, doesn't mean that their second sickness is evil and lazy writing. Thomas has been sick quite a few times. Thomas felt very miserable. One morning, Thomas wouldn't wake up. His driver and fireman couldn't make him start. His fire went out and there was not enough steam. In addition, Henry still tackled a whole huge train and tried his best to get through. We should be awarding that as a consistency, not inconsistency. As for Thomas and Percy, I can't say I understand why people think they're out of character here. They were jerks in a railway series, and I don't think them basically bullying Henry is too many steps away from that, at least not for Thomas. Season 7 actually had better writing than Season 6 for me, because it was more character driven and varied. Again, I'm drifting towards talking about the characters too much. Speaking of which, maybe it's time I'm allowed to rant about them. Part 2, The Characters These two seasons have some of the best new characters of any seasons in the franchise. Let's start with Season 6. Salty is undoubtedly the standout here, he had a strong debut, and is one of the most prominent secondary characters in the show to this day. Every single episode he's been in layers his personality even more, and it all began in Season 6. Salty is probably just about in my top 10 favourite characters of all time, and that's a testament to the ingenuity that the team had during the Ghislaine era. I have less to say about Harvey. I don't hate him, but I've never thought of him as a particularly strong character. His debut is kind of meh, and he fulfills his purpose and pops up here and there in future seasons. His design is certainly unique, and to this day, I'm not sure whether I like it or not. He's more of a plot device to fix accidents on the railway than a character, similarly to Rocky. Elizabeth is a fun character, and one I'm really sad didn't get too much development leading on from Season 8. She works well, and the moment she sasses the Fat Controller and their special history is revealed is a really fun one. Honestly, she's one of the stronger female characters that has come out of the show. On the one hand, she'll stand her ground and is very determined, those are admirable qualities. But at the same time, this also means she can be quite rude and bossy. This gives her two really interesting sides to her personality that don't feel quite right without the other. She has a unique design and a unique character. I do feel I have to give a mention to the pack as well, since they are kind of intrinsically linked to season 6 and 7. There are a few people asking for my opinion on them, and I like them. I don't think they were ever going to set the world on fire, but they were a cool concept and I wish they'd appeared a bit more. Jack's two season 6 episodes weren't the greatest of the season, but they provided a solid foundation for the pack characters to work off. If they'd given them a couple more episodes to expand on Alfie and other important characters before the spin-off started, replacing the poorer episodes of the season, then I might think the pack the best part of season 6. I won't say too much about the spin-off itself, because that's a little off topic, other than I find the cancelled episodes super interesting and wish the show had continued with a little less interference from Hit. Again, I have much more to say about the Season 7 side of things. These are some of the best non-Audrey characters in the show, mostly for their designs. They were all very unique concepts that were clearly inspired by a similar creative talent to that which Audrey had when dreaming of the books. Let's start with Emily. Although Seasons 8 through 12 will always be my favourite incarnation of Emily, Season 7 does her really well too. She's introduced in a decent debut to start the season off, 
but the way the season expands on her character is genius. After her introduction, she makes several more appearances, but in secondary roles, normally acting as the giver of advice or compassion, notably in Salty Stormy Tale and What's the Matter with Henry. They introduce her, and then slip her in wherever the season needs a character afterwards to get the audience much more used to her. Emily was a great concept, her design is a fascinating one, with a lot of real life history behind it, and she's a strong character here and going forward, albeit in a slightly different style from season 8 onwards. Fergus is also a good character. I made a video on him which is unlisted but available through one of my playlists. In it I talked about how he was essentially based off the personality of his designer's guardian, and to me that makes him much more interesting as a character. Fergus Breaks the Rules is certainly his standout episode, and most of his others are good as well. His dynamic with Bill and Ben is certainly interesting to watch, and I think he's a character I'd like to see more of someday. Arthur is in my top 20 characters of all time for design alone. His design is so unique, and it's nice to see a larger tank engine for once. His ongoing dynamic with Thomas is handled really well. I think Arthur and Fergus have a lot of similarities. They're both good characters that play on the perfectionist trope, but in different ways. Fergus is more strict and has very strong opinions. Arthur is more mild, like a quiet student who focuses on doing his best, and beats himself up if he feels like his spotless record has been broken. Murdoch. This character is another one with an absolutely sick design, but personally, I don't see him as having much character. I know there are certain people in my audience that will want to murder me for saying that, but understand that I really don't hate this character. It was nice seeing him in Best Dressed Engine as a more recurring character. Much like Harvey, he worked fine for the purpose he served, but he wasn't really anything special for me. Spencer is a different kettle of fish. My third favourite character of all time, I cannot get enough of this guy. Gordon really needed a rival to bring out more sides of his character, and the team recognised this and gave him one. This is one of the reasons I love Season 7. Every new character, except perhaps Murdoch, brings out something new in our main cast. Emily brings out new sides of Thomas and Henry. Fergus brings out new sides of Bill, Ben and Diesel. Arthur brings out another side of Thomas, and Spencer brings out a new aspect to Gordon. Season 7 has a huge cast, but every new character contributed something and made their mark on the season, unlike Season 6, where the new characters pretty much all just appeared for their debut episode. The existing cast were also treated fairly well in both seasons. There aren't too many character inconsistencies, but the main cast were somewhat reduced to just a couple of characteristics. Thomas is naive and in full classic personality, Edward is the old reliable figure, Henry begins to lose some of his confidence, James is always boastful, etc. It's worth noting that there are gaps in the main cast for both seasons. Henry is barely seen at all in Season 6, and in Season 7, Duck takes somewhat of a back seat. In both seasons, we did see plenty of fan favourites getting the spotlight. Duck played a lead role in Scare the Engines, Donald and Douglas drove the stories of Twin Trouble and Bad Day at Castle Loch, and Oliver was the star in Snow Engine. In addition, the episode Faulty Whistles at the end of Season 6 was essentially an adaptation of the railway series story Mike's Whistle, just using the narrow gauge engines. There was certainly a good bit of fan service in these seasons, and for the most part it was done quite well. I want to dedicate some time to the narrow gauge engines, because I think that these two seasons treated them completely differently. First of all, Season 6 only has three narrow gauge episodes, whereas Season 7 has twice that. But I want to look more at the format, the way these episodes were placed in the seasons, because I think it's quite telling. In Season 6, all three of the Scarlowy Railway centric episodes were at the end of the season in a block of three. Now that might seem like a minor detail, but I really don't like it. It almost seems like the narrow gauge episodes were added on as an afterthought. To be fair, Season 5 is a little better in this regard, but I like having the narrow gauge episodes very much interspersed between the standard gauge ones. You get a feel for the variety of the universe that way. Season 7 does this brilliantly. That being said, I do feel that Season 7 didn't do the Scarlet Railway justice in the way it was modelled. In Season 6 and before, the railway was always full of trees, shrubs and bubbling rivers, very warm and cosy, while having a harsher aspect to it with the storms and flooding, which contrasted really well. In Season 7, however, the Scarlet Railway just looks like a giant plain of rock and mist, and wide rivers, and feels very open and exposed. The hit era actually remedied this somewhat but I'm not really a fan of it here. But let's move on to some more miscellaneous stuff, starting with the narration. Part 3, The Narration. To be honest, I don't like any of the narration for these seasons. In both cases, I think America had it worse, but the UK dubs still aren't fantastic either. 
Alec Baldwin was going through some pretty tough stuff in his life at this point, and just lacked enthusiasm in his season 6 narrations, including the infamous Scary Jack Frost, cried James. Michelangelus was fairly good in season 6, particularly in Thomas and the Jet Engine, but he still lacked the same energy he had when voicing seasons 3 through 5. If season 6 had mediocre narration, then season 7 was in a different league altogether, and not in a good way. Let's talk about Michael Brandon. Michael Brandon has the unique talent of complete inconsistency with his narration. In season 7, he was absolutely rubbish and the characters' voices simply didn't work. And then in season 8, he did some of the best American narration since Carlin. To be fair to the guy, Brandon's narration for season 7 was done on fairly short notice after Baldwin dropped out. Angelus was still narrating for the UK, but was much slower and just lacked his previous energy. Personally, I think he picked up a little again in season 9, but that's just my opinion. The narration for these seasons certainly does set them apart from the previous five, and not in a good way, but what comes next does not. Part 4. Music. So I know nothing about music, like absolutely nothing, it's my worst class in school and I just don't try and question it too much. However, my friend Stephanie Bolstrud Music, who makes some really creative Thomas remixes and mashups, link in the description by the way, kindly agreed to advise me on this part of the video so that we can pretend I'm really a music genius. No, just kidding. Pretty much everything I say about music from this point is from Stephanie Bolstrud's expertise, so seriously, check him out. Stephanie says that he thinks it's a bit of a mistake to lump the music from these two seasons together. He explains that season 6 brought the woodwind section of music to the fore, with more flute-based themes. This continued into season 7, which also introduced more experimental styles which incorporated brass, Spencer's theme being a great example of this. In addition, the music which introduced episodes was more varied and often used various themes layered on top of each other. Both seasons did things with music never before seen in Thomas, particularly season 6, with Irish pub melodies and 3-4 waltz remixes. Toby's Windmill is a standout episode for the music alone, with a beautiful rendition of Toby's theme and then a chilling version of the ominous theme used for Boulder in Season 5, it really strikes a great balance between light-hearted and dark. We both agree that we enjoy Season 6's music more, but there are still plenty of great themes in Season 7 as well. This is certainly an area in which both seasons stay close to the previous ones in terms of quality. Part 5. Everything else. Let's talk about the model work in these seasons. Other than the aforementioned problems I have with the Scarlet Railway, it's beautiful for the most part. Castle Loch and Misty Valley were very impressive set pieces here, and the engine models were mostly unchanged. One location stands above the rest for me, and that is Suddery Castle. It's really stunning and is used in multiple shops which are really beautiful. Rusty Saves the Day is another fantastic celebration of model work and set design, even if the plot is a little, well, inconsistent. The model work in these seasons is by and large very good, particularly with the detail on smaller set pieces, such as the bridge in Toby Had Little Lamb. The weather effects are strong here as well, they create a much better atmosphere than snow and wind in CGI. It's worth noting that both these seasons, although season 7 in particular, were shot on a very tight budget, and therefore the fact that the practical effects were still strong is quite impressive. The colour of these seasons is another important aspect to discuss. Season 6 is infamous for having the most desaturated colour of any season, and it certainly does look dull, particularly in scenes where the sets would normally be colourful and vibrant. Season 7 doesn't suffer from this as much, and in my opinion, it has one of the best colour contrasts of any season. In fact, one thing I noticed when re-watching is just how much Season 7 uses colour to differentiate locations. The greens of Callan Castle, the red fires of the smelters, and that yellowy stone colour for the quarry all create a real sense of difference, and I like that. Sodor's geography was always at its finest when there was real uniqueness in each set. That's my main gripe with the likes of Season 8. The sets looked the same, by and large, and everything was green and grey, except for the winter episodes. And finally for this section, I want to talk about some technical stuff. The variety of camera angles and shot compositions was much the same in these seasons as it had been previously, but there was one glaring issue in Season 7 which I know that people will be wanting me to talk about, and that's the copious amounts of stock footage. Like, seriously, there was so much stock footage in Season 7. Season 6 didn't have too much, but 7 was just filled with it. Season 7 has a very strange production history that I still don't fully understand, but suffice to say that I would say stock footage makes up a good sixth of the running time in total, and even more than that in episodes like Toby's Windmill. This was likely due to the aforementioned tight budget. So those are some opinions from me, 
But let's take a look at what the community thinks of these two seasons. Community Opinions For this video, I made a short survey about these seasons and posted it on the wiki, in my own community tab, and on Sodor Island forums. I asked four simple questions. Which season of the two is your favourite? Which thing was best about season 6? Which thing was best about season 7? And finally, if people regarded them as classic seasons or not. Let's take a look at the results. I asked for responses on this form, and thankfully, I got a couple. Looking at the first question, I gave you guys three options. To say that you preferred season 6, to say that you preferred season 7, or to say that you felt pretty much the same way about both of them. Interestingly, the results were surprisingly close. Overall, Season 6 is preferred, but Season 7 has a lot of supporters as well, at roughly a third of the total vote. There is also a sizable group of people who would lump them into pretty much the same category. The next question is also very evenly split. People were asked which aspect of Season 6 they enjoyed the most, and it seems that opinions are very divided on this point. The new characters won the majority of votes, with the model work coming in at second. Opinions on Season 7 were not nearly as divided, however. The new characters of the season won the majority here as well, but this time at a whopping 60% of the total vote, leaving the model work and writing trailing in its wake. The new characters of season 7 rival those of the five seasons before, no question. It's the last question, however, that I personally want to devote the most time to. I asked whether people considered these two seasons as classic seasons, and what can I say except that I wasn't expecting the results. Roughly half of respondents said that they do consider Season 6 and 7 classic, which was certainly not what I envisaged. We'll get to whether I agree in just a moment, but what's really interesting here is the next largest percentage of voters, who said that the seasons were very much varied from episode to episode. One episode could be a classic through and through, and another could be a boring cash grab. In a way, I'm really happy that this option was voted quite highly. In many online communities, and sometimes in our own, we look at things as very black and white. Old Thomas good, new Thomas bad. But there's a lot more nuance than that, and I'm really glad that people are able to appreciate it. There were also minorities of voters who didn't think that the seasons were good enough to be compared to seasons 1 through 5, and a small proportion thought that season 6 made the cut, but season 7 didn't. Are they classic seasons? So we've had to look at what a portion of the community think, but what are my views? Personally, I feel that seasons 6 and 7 are classic seasons, and that they still count as a time when Thomas was way more than just another kids show. Particularly, the new characters shine throughout. However, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Season 7 is more of a classic season than Season 6 is. Season 7 had better characters, narration, model work, and, dare I say it, overall better writing than Season 6. 6 has some really good gems, but 7 is more consistent throughout, and other than one or two stinkers, is a solidly good season. Sure, it had the problems of overusing stock footage, and maybe not having the best narration, but it almost feels like a sequel to season 5 in the variety of stories that we have. Some are dark, some are light-hearted, and some are just in between. And so, that's my verdict. I can't deny that these seasons simply aren't as good as the ones preceding them, but I would still hold them as classic seasons, and it seems that, at the very least, a portion of the community would agree with me on that. For many people, these seasons marked the end of Thomas as we knew it. For me personally, that continues until The Great Discovery, but I will not deny that Season 7 was the last truly golden season of the show that we love so much. Here's to Thomas and Friends and all the magic it held in its early days. Even in these lesser classic seasons, Thomas didn't need any supernatural engines or gold dust to be magical. It was magical in the most real of ways. And that, at the end of the day, is why we love it. This was a video that I will never forget making. This video is easily my favourite on the channel so far, and it would mean so much to me if you would subscribe because of it. Tell your friends as well! I really enjoy having lots of people discuss in the comments. I want to give another massive shout out to my friend Stephanie Bolster of Music. The music section of this video would not have been possible without him, and he provided much of the music used in the video itself. Seriously, go subscribe to him, he makes amazing stuff. Huge thanks to everyone who took part in the survey, and to everyone who's even watched this far. Now, for those interested, here's a quick channel update. There may or may not be a video next week, I put a lot of effort into this one, and honestly just need a bit of time to rest up. I'll probably inform you folks nearer the time. I still have plenty of video ideas, and I'm looking forward to doing more of what I love. So, thanks for watching, please subscribe to boost my ego, and until the next time, 
have a good one.